Welcome to the programme. Have you seen any elements of this bill or uh, at least the criticism of the law? Yes, absolutely. And while the online safety bill is set to regulate online content, as you mentioned, it's supposed to provide protection against online harassment, abuse and fraud, in addition to reducing the amount of bots on social media. We're going to most likely see a suppression of freedom of speech and it will likely have an effect on mainstream media. And what's more concerning is the five member commission appointed by the president, which will have the power to assess any statements um, online on social media, direct their removal and impose penalties on the offenders. So again, the concept of freedom of speech is that people have the right to say what they want, but if there is an online safety commission that will decide on what online speech is false or harmful, we do see some serious problems for human rights and the protection of freedom of expression. I just want to quote the UN Human Rights Office, which uh, had commented when the legislation was being drafted, and it said that the bill would give the authorities unfettered discretion to label and restrict expressions that they disagree with as being false statements. Tolly, in terms of the space for public discourse, in, spa in, 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 in terms of how countries and their democracies function and how strong those democracies are, is there a clear correlation in terms of how governments control the internet and others who allow more freedoms? Absolutely. And we can definitely see a parallel between a threat to democracy, um, which, again, we saw with the activists and opposition party protesting outside parliament the day that it was passed. And we do see a stifling from establishment because, again, there is this fear of anti-establishment rhetoric. And this is largely because of the country's economic situation. Of course, in April of 2022, Sri Lanka declared itself bankrupt with more than $83 billion worth of debt. So, of course, we're seeing a link to suppression of free speech due to the economic crisis and government austerity. And we can draw potential parallels between this act and what the Nigerian government did um, about two years ago, mm. banning Twitter mm. in the country. And again, that was due to protests and SARS government violence against civilians. So again, Twitter and the likes, or now X and the likes, these social media platforms are extremely powerful, especially with live streams, because they shed light on government activity, police brutality, and all of these things. So we can assume um, what the UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights stated. It's, it's definitely holds weight. And we saw this echoed with the US ambassador, Julie Chung, because she expressed concern on this legislation, how it threatens the freedom of expression, innovation, and most importantly, privacy. Because if you can control and penalize civilians for making statements online, if you decide that these statements are false or harmful, then there's a thin line between privacy, the right to privacy, freedom of expression, and fundamental human rights. And of course, some of these punishments include heavy fines for social media users and five-year jail terms. So again, we're seeing crippling and definitely unconstitutional punishments for a simple act of stating something online, an opinion. Tolo Akarele, thank you so much indeed, Tolo. Really, really interesting to hear the analysis. Thank you.